Sprites are an interesting subject on the NES. There's a limit for how many can be on a single scan line, and Flickr is a characteristic that defines the system. Flickr deserves its own dive, as does the usage of the Sprite Zero Hit functionality. But before tackling those topics, it's best to know more about how sprites work on the system. This video is not a programming tutorial, but I believe learning about NES sprites is worth a deeper dive. And that said, this is going to be one of the more technical videos in the series so far. Stick with me through the tech and we'll check out some fun examples of NES sprite architecture at work. First off, let's define what a sprite is, because the term is rather ambiguous. This is Mario. He is created by placing four sprites on the screen. The graphics for those sprites are defined by indicating which tile to use from a table of tile patterns. Outside of the development community, it's fairly common to refer to this Mario graphic on the left as a sprite. However, since we are diving into how things work on the NES, let's say that instances of these tiles are sprites, and the assembled sprites are entities. I won't use the word entity much, but I don't want any ambiguity when it comes to my use of the term sprite many, many times throughout this video. Now. Object, Attribute, Memory, or OAM, is memory inside the NES graphics chip that holds sprite information for up to 64 sprites for the frame to be rendered. Each sprite's information requires 4 bytes, and so we have 256 bytes for OAM. Let's hop to the emulator so we can illustrate these bytes using a game as an example. Let's use Super Mario Bros. because why not? Emulator window running the game shows Mario and a Goomba as two entities on the screen, and each entity appears to be made up of four 8x8 sprites. Here are the contents of OEM for the current frame. This is the sprite viewer. At the bottom, it illustrates the sprites that we see on the game screen, and at the top, it uses tiles to interpret and illustrate OEM data in the same order as the OEM bytes. Speaking of tiles, here are our banks of tile patterns that are referenced to illustrate that OEM data we interpreted up top over here. And while we're at it, how about we also show the palettes? Wouldn't want to leave out those colors. Now, lots of numbers and colors. The back of Big Mario's head is everywhere in this table. What's going on here? It's quite simple. Just give me a moment to explain. Four bytes per sprite. The first four bytes in OEM represent sprite zero, this partial coin at the top of the screen. Byte zero is Y position, 18 hex is 24 in decimal. Byte one is the tile, the value is FF. If we examine tile ID FF in our table, we see the bottom of the coin sprite in our character viewer. Therefore, our sprite viewer OEM table shows the bottom of the coin sprite. Now there are some specifics regarding which pattern table is selected, but let's keep it simple for this video. Byte 2 is for sprite attributes, 23 hex in our example. Let's illustrate this as a binary value. This helps us see the flags and values within. The lowest two bits tell us which palette to use, numbered 0 to 3. The coin uses the last sprite palette, palette 3. The priority is 1, which means it's behind the background. And these zeros mean it isn't flipped horizontally or vertically. So we can stuff a handful of attributes into this single byte. Pretty useful. Finally, byte 3 shows an X position of 58 hex, which is 88 in decimal. Okay, there are a single sprite's values in OAM illustrated using the appropriate tile graphic and the position and attributes. As we continue to move through OAM RAM in groups of four bytes at a time, the sprites are illustrated in our table. Why do we see these instances of the back of Super Mario's head? The graphical resolution of the NES is 256 by 240. Valid values for that 240 pixel vertical axis are 0 to 239. If the Y position of a sprite is between 239 and 256, the sprite is hidden. All of these tiles we see of Super Mario's head have a Y position of 248 and are therefore hidden. The remaining three bytes for each of these are set to zero. Unused or unrendered would be the appropriate terms for these sprite slots in OAM. Since the tile index in the second byte is zero, the emulator just loads the tile it finds at index zero and shows it in the sprite viewer. Harmless. We don't see these on the screen, but the viewer still illustrates the tile ID to create this table of graphics. Now, a few of you may have noticed the sprite hide functionality for Y position kicks in at 239. Does this mean you can't place a sprite on the bottommost pixel? Well, no. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Sprite data is delayed by one scan line. 
In other words, the Y position provided in OAM indicates the scan line for the associated sprite evaluation for placement. That sprite will then be rendered starting on the next scan line. So, you need to subtract 1 from your desired sprite Y coordinate on screen before it gets placed in OEM RAM. The top left of the coin sprite appears on scan line 25 because the value in OAM indicates Y position 24. This is very important if you are coding an NES game or an emulator. That also means sprites are never displayed on the first line of the screen. Also, it's impossible to place a partial sprite off the top of the screen. But wait a second, we know of a very obvious example of where we can steer sprites off the top of the screen. Let's take a closer look. Watch Mario at the top of the screen here. If we jump up, the game removes the topmost layer of Mario as it continues to animate his jump off the top of the screen. No sprite pixels appear on the first line, and no partial sprites are shown. As Mario continues to move upward, the logic responsible for locating his individual sprites peels off his sprite layers from top to bottom by assigning a Y position that hides the applicable sprites. When the PPU sees OEM data containing Y position values outside of the valid range, it doesn't draw them. So there is a crash course in OEM, Object Attribute Memory. We know what each of the four bytes contain for the 64 possible sprites, as well as a few of their quirks and features when it comes to placement and rendering. Now describing OEM makeup is the middle step in our process from code to rendered. Code has to provide OEM data for the PPU, and the PPU has to analyze this data and combine sprites and background tiles one pixel at a time, line by line. Let's stick with the PPU's work and move forward in the process. How does it handle this OEM data that it has been provided? Our focus for this step is PPU sprite evaluation, and it is just as important as it sounds. We finally reached the big topic, sprite priority. Better grab a taco, this one's gonna get technical. The order of sprites in OAM determines their priority. All entries in OAM are evaluated on each visible scan line. If a sprite is found to be within the Y range, that sprite's four OAM bytes are copied to secondary OAM, a separate area of memory in the PPU used for holding sprite data for rendering a single scan line. Secondary OEM has 32 bytes available, which is enough to hold, yep, data for up to 8 sprites for a given scan line. With a max of 8 sprites queued up prior to rendering the respective scan line, the background and the sprite are evaluated on a per pixel basis and a winner is chosen for output. In the battle of background versus sprite, who gets the pixel? Well, let's examine the palettes to see what pixels are possible. Each tile, background or sprite, has three colors to use from their selected palette, numbered 1, 2, and 3. A value of 0 indicates transparency. Well, what if both the background tile and sprite tile use the 0 color index and are therefore transparent for their pixel evaluation? There is a universal background color, or backdrop if you prefer, indicated by the first palette address byte. That is the color used. So with this in mind, we have a table that explains which color we see for a given pixel provided the background color index, sprite color index, and the sprite priority flag that indicates foreground or background for the sprite. You can pause and view this table if you wish. It should seem pretty self-explanatory at this point. So with two priorities in mind, sprite versus sprite and sprite versus background, let's get some examples going here. Mario and a Goomba. Let's disable collision for the sake of illustrating sprite priority and have ourselves a sprite face-off. If we view OAM, Mario's four sprites occur before the Goomba's four sprites. If I set a breakpoint to stop at scan line 200 and PPU cycle 320, secondary OAM should be evaluated for the next line by this point in time, and we have 16 bytes for our four sprites on this scan line, two Mario and two Goomba in secondary OAM. I told you this was going to get technical. The yellow line in the event viewer shows that we are currently drawing scan line 200. The previous frames graphics are below the line, and the new frames graphics that are replacing them are above it. We are frozen at this moment in time. If we let the game roll, 
The Goomba appears to pass behind Mario. In reality, the Goomba isn't rendered in the areas where Mario has a non-transparent pixel. A simple matter of priority. Let's roll this back and I'll show you something else that is a bit quirky when it comes to priority between background and multiple sprites. Let's use the full entities here for the sake of sprite illustration. The highest priority sprite that has a non-transparent pixel for the current pixel being evaluated versus the background will always win over another would-be overlapping sprite in the same location with a lower priority. That's the first part of this. We just saw the Goomba in the same location as Mario, and Mario's non-transparent pixels won the battle of priority because his sprites were higher priority in OAM. Makes sense, right? But here's the second part of this and the key point. It doesn't matter if the higher priority sprite is behind the background. The lower priority foreground sprite will not be rendered in any location where the higher priority sprite's non-transparent pixels would exist. What does this mean? We can't evaluate and render a triple layer stack of non-transparent pixels. If we force Mario's sprites to be behind the background and let the Goomba continue walking, Goomba pixels disappear whenever they pass over the background where a Mario pixel would be behind it. The reason why we see Mario's silhouette shine through is because some Goomba pixels are rendered where the Mario sprites have transparent pixels. This is an intentional glitch of sorts we created on the fly to demonstrate lack of layering multiple sprites independent of background and priority. But how about we dive into real game situations that use it as a feature? Mario hits a block and a power up or coin emerges, a very traditional action in Mario games. How do the graphics work? Let's face off the original game with Mario 3. In the first game, the question mark block is made of background tiles. When Mario jumps and punches it, the background tiles are replaced temporarily with transparent tiles, so the universal background color bleeds through it, and the block is now made out of sprites. The sprites animate upward, return to the starting position, and turn back into background tiles. The mushroom sprites now appear with background priority and can now emerge from behind the set of background tiles. Since all background tiles above the block use transparent pixels, we can see the mushroom sprites on the screen even though they have background priority. The solid color background you see is actually the backdrop color shining through. Also note that the mushroom sprites priorities are changed to foreground after they have emerged from the block. This allows them to now pass in front of background tiles. Three years later, Super Mario Bros. 3 arrives. Block power-up emergence is different. OEM priority for sprites plays a key role. Mario strikes the question mark block and the same technique from Mario 1 is used to animate that block. When it is time for the mushroom to emerge, things are different. And this is about knowledge of the hardware. A set of block sprite tiles with background priority are placed behind the background block tiles we see on the screen. So these sprites are completely hidden. In fact, if we disable background tiles, we can now see them. These block sprites have highest priority in OAM. The game also spawns a pair of foreground mushroom sprites. The mushroom sprites have a lower priority in OAM than the block sprites and are placed at the same location on the screen. We already know that the highest priority sprite in OAM at a location wins the layering contest between two or more sprites, and it does not matter if that highest priority sprite is a background sprite. The whole point of these block sprites is to prevent foreground mushroom sprites from being rendered within this area of pixels. What this does is allow a set of foreground mushroom sprites to appear behind the background. OAM priority makes it happen. This mushroom should be rendered in front of this block. However, these sprites prevent mushroom pixels from being rendered at all within this area. Now, what is the advantage to this though? Mario 1's method limits power-up sprites with background priority from emerging only in front of the universal background color. If there were any non-transparent background tiles here, these background mushroom sprites would be behind them. Mario 3's usage of OAM priority to spawn power-up sprites with foreground priority means that power-ups can animate upward from behind background tiles, yet also appear in front of background tiles in the area directly above. 
all of this work was done for something that would seem to be so simple, a prime example of hard work for the little things that sure add polish to the game. Okay, let's kick things up and exceed eight sprites on a line. What happens when OAM is copied to secondary OAM and we find a ninth sprite or more present on the same scan line? Castlevania II Simon's Quest uses it for when Simon is in the swamp. You can see that there are many 8x16 sprites early in OAM that are composed of 100% transparent tiles. They are unused in the town area as their Y position is located outside of a valid range. If we walk to the left of town, things will change. The Y positions remain 248 until we reach a point about right here. Now the majority of them have a Y position of 208. They have valid coordinates. Eight of them are now considered a match for sprite evaluation for the Y range they cover and are placed in secondary OAM for this set of scan lines. I'll use the sprite viewer to turn the 100% transparent pixels into white boxes. Now we can see a box in the swamp. When Simon jumps into the swamp, his lower half disappears gracefully, as once any pixels in the lower half of his body begin to occupy the same range as the eight dummy sprites, they don't show up. Secondary OAM for this range of sprite evaluation is full of these dummy sprites. There are no remaining bites for Simon's two leg sprites. The game uses the eight sprites per line limit to hide Simon's lower half by clogging up secondary OAM for those scan lines. If we walk through the swamp, you'll see that the dummy sprite slots are placed in a section further to the left so they stay in range and continue to dominate the space of secondary OAM. A nice trick used by Konami for smoother submersion. One interesting bug, if you want to call it that, is when there is a change from day to night or night to day. When the box appears in the sky, the sprites used for the health bar are replaced with the dummy boxes, and all Y positions for those boxes are set to 248, a hidden value. I assume this is just part of a reinitialization in the code. I didn't look. If the sprites are all hidden, then they are no longer responsible for hiding Simon's legs in the swamp. That means the transition animation shows his legs. After it is complete, all sprites are relocated to their proper place and his legs are hidden once again. The Legend of Zelda does the same thing so Link can move through the doorways in the dungeon and the appropriate pixels for his sprites are not rendered when he is under the graphics for the top of the doorway. We probably don't think much about this at all today, but this is a pretty slick example of knowing hardware and exploiting a limitation to add polish to a game. I won't go on the record of saying Zelda did it first, but something as simple as this would seem to set Zelda apart from other NES games in early 1986 and prior when it came to reducing that blocky feel that the tile-based NES hardware tended to have. Oh, I guess they used the same trick on the outside too, right? Well, not quite. A different method is used here. I'll call it the airlock method. Link's sprites have foreground priority, simple enough. This area here is occupied by background tiles that are 100% transparent. The black color we see is thanks to the universal background color as indicated by the color defined here. After Link is walked into the area occupied by the transparent background, his priority is changed from foreground to background. Since he's standing on 100% transparent background tiles, we don't see a change or even a flicker. His sprites are then lowered behind the background tiles he was just standing upon. If you disable the background tiles in the emulator, you can see that the player moves him up with the controller and then the game code autopilots him down. The use of a foreground to background priority switch while standing in a 100% transparent background tile airlock allows for a smoother transition into a dungeon. Well, there you go. There are some fun examples. All of this detail about sprites, OEM, priorities, quirks, and features, and we didn't touch upon Flickr. If you enjoyed this video and would like to touch upon Sprite Flickr in a future video, please like, comment, and subscribe to Displaced Gamers. I also have a Patreon available if you are interested, and thanks for watching.